Amen. So, discipleship, lesson two, part two, necessary discipleship attitudes. Maybe that's the reason I had to adjust this this morning before we got into talking about attitudes. <laughs> As with most things in life, discipleship is all about attitude. It's all about attitude. Without the proper attitude, no amount of training or knowledge will bring about a, a discipled change. Without the proper attitude. I like what Dr. Barclay says, so goes your attitude, so goes your life. Because however your attitude goes, if you want to try to put on a facade and try to act all religious and, and do that with your attitude, then you'll go nowhere. You'll be like the children of Israel. You'll just keep going around in a circle and then wonder why nothing's ever happening, nothing's ever changing. And then what happens? You look to the world for your solution. Well, that over there, well, that over there looks better. Let me go over that way. And God says, no, no, that's not what I want you to do. I want you to go over here. I got promises for you. I got a promised land that flows with milk and honey. But all you got to do is obey me, submit to me, and that can, that can be yours. Amen. But it's about our attitude. We have the give up mentality of, oh, it's just too big. It's just too hard. Or are we going to serve God, take him at his word, walk in faith and walk in belief in him and obtain our victory? Amen. But it's about your attitude. So it goes with discipleship. If, you're, if you really want discipleship and to be changed and to have a better life, you submit to discipleship and you submit to the things of God, the word of God, you apply it to your heart and your life and victory comes. Amen. So without the proper attitude, no amount of training or knowledge will bring a disciple change. With the attitude, no amount of training. I could train you all day long. You know, it's, it's, it's bad enough I've seen a lot of people sit under my pastor have all kinds of training, all kinds of knowledge, and with a bad attitude, they go nowhere. That should not be any Christian's testimony, but it shouldn't be ours. But it's easy, though. It's easier because we're in a re religious region, so it's easy to put on that facade to, say, to take all of the knowledge, to take all of the training, you know, to take what well, we could say even SMTI to have all the you know the all the doctrines, all the pot school lessons, all of the you know curriculum I've written, all the notes from every message I've ever done, and to be able to have all that knowledge and training, but still have a bad attitude toward God because your heart's not right with Him, so you go nowhere. The only two that ever made it to see their promised land was Joshua and Caleb because of their attitude. Not because of their training. Not because you know, they won these great and mighty victories and God said, all right, I like you more. I'm going to put you in there. It was because of their attitude. They said, I want what God has and nobody's going to keep me from it. Because they were discipled by Moses who said, you know what? I'm, I've been out here in the wilderness. I've done all this. I've trained to be a shepherd. I don't want to go back there, but you know what, God, if that's what you want me to do, that's what I'll go do. And he set the people free, and that they learned something from him. They were discipled by Moses to say, you know what, if God says it, we can do it. If God says it, we can do it. I may not be 100% you know, fully, full-fledged, ready to go into this head first, but I know that God said to do it, so I'm going anyway. Whether I'm afraid or whether I'm not, I'm following him because I take him at his word. I've seen his miracles. I've seen his presence too many times to go back on him now. Amen. Amen. This is already preaching a lot better than your amen and then we're in Sunday school. Below are good discipleship attitudes. Number one is your heart. Everything in your life revolves around your heart. Having a right heart will get you further in life because if you have a right heart with God, God can bless you. If you have a wrong heart with God, you'll go nowhere because it's up to you to do it on your own because your heart's not right with God. Now, that, is, that just doesn't mean being born again. That also means after you're born again that you don't allow others to get into your way and to hinder your walk with God. Or you even have the religious attitude of saying, you know what, I go to church, I do this, I do that, but you know that's all I need of God. That's having the form of godliness but denying the power thereof. So everything in our life revolves around our heart. So first of all, you must have a heart for discipleship. You must have a heart for discipleship. If you don't have a heart for it, you'll lie, you'll connive, you'll have a facade, you won't allow your disciple maker to actually speak into your life, you won't tell them, be upfront with things, you won't allow them to have entrance into your life. You know, there's things that, that I allow entrance to my pastor because he's my disciple maker, 
that even in the past when I was under him every service and around him a lot more than what I am now, but I gave, I gave him entrance to so much of my life that one, I was thinking, man, if anybody really did see this, they would think it was a cult if they were outside of that. But to see it from the Word of God, to see how much entrance the disciples gave Jesus, it made them the better for it to where they were actually crucified because of how hard they preached, because of how much they lived for God, how much they were devoted to God, all because they submitted to Jesus and said, change whatever you want to me, speak to me, call me the devil, call me whatever, ask me if I'm going to quit. And they didn't get offended at it. Jesus turned around and said, are you going to quit me too? He said, are you going to quit? Because everybody else is. Are you going to, now's your time. Now's your opportunity. And they didn't. They stuck it out. And they became not only the disciples of Jesus Christ, but they became the apostles of the Lamb. They became more than disciples. They became apostles because they said, you know what? Whatever you say on, Lord, whatever you want in my life, whatever you have interest in anything I have and all that I am, you have interest to it. That doesn't mean that we become a cult, nothing like that. But it just shows the openness and the transparency because they had a heart for that discipleship to say, God, I'm yours. Jesus, I'm yours. Speak on, say on. Whatever you want in me, whatever you want to change in me, you, I allow you to do it. And this is why many pastors don't have disciples and they're afraid to. They're afraid to disciple. Because one, they're afraid of rejection. They're afraid of somebody saying, no, I don't want that. I don't want that. I've been taught by my pastor, I'll disciple you. And really, I can make you into a good disciple. I'm not bragging, I'm just telling you because I have that lineage of disciple makers. I've learned a thing or two because I've seen a thing or two. <laughs> As the old commercial goes. But it's, it's one of those where I have seen how this process works and I can help make you into a wonderful disciple if you'll receive it, if you'll have a heart for it, if you'll be open, honest, and upfront about things. I don't expect everybody to be perfect. I'm not perfect. I tell my pastor I'm not perfect. And what happens though? Because I have a heart for discipleship, I allow him to speak into my life and to help me. And I say, all right, if my pastor says that, that's what I'm doing. I've told, I've, I've heard my disciple makers, my spiritual father, Dr. Barclay, and you know, my pastor say this, the Lord be careful what you tell pastor to tell me because you know I'll do it, God. And I mean that. Because Miss Tiffany can vouch. Anything that our pastor's told us to do, nine times out of ten, I've done it. That tenth time is usually me being lazy or me saying, ah, oh, Lord, I'm not ready to do that yet. But then I have to get my act together, get my heart right in that area of my life and say, all right, Lord, pastor said to do it, I got to do it. Not because I'm obeying man, but because I know that is my spiritual gift from Jesus Christ to speak into my life, to mature me, to disciple me, to equip me, and to help me to be who I need to be in Christ. Not my cult leader, my disciple maker, my gift from Jesus Christ. I've learned as a pastor, I pitch straw. You're either going to eat it or you're not. You're either going to grow and mature in the things of God or you're not. And if you don't want it, I've got a wife and three kids I can take care of that, that I can disciple. <laughs> I told you it's going to be punchy because of the spirit of religion. You say, well, man, those, those religious people in this region need to get their act together. No, you need to get your act together because you've allowed it to speak and minister to you and you brought it into our house of God. Amen. I'm not like these other pastors. I won't stand for it. I'll run it off or run you off, whichever one goes first. Amen. That heart has one simple mantra. I want what they have. That's what a proper heart towards discipleship will say. I want what they have. Not in vehicle, not in finances, not in this, not in that, but a walk with God. That's the reason I love being around my pastor, being around other great and mighty men of God like Dr. Barclay, others that, you know, that I can be around at conferences and other things is because I'll see their walk with God and I see the blessings of God in their life and I see because they walk with him what he has done in their life and I say, I want what they have. I want that kind of walk with God, not to be just like them, not to be in many of them. I want that kind of walk with God. I want that level of intimacy with God. 
You don't have to understand everything. You just have to want better than you already are. And that right there will kill so many Christians walk with God. Because they don't want better. They're satisfied. Because they're so full of the world, they almost got a runny tummy full of the world, that they don't want anything of God. They don't want anything of God. It's like, you know, when you see these, when you see people go to a buffet, they'll stuff their face where they can't fit one more thing. They're like on the verge of throwing up. It's just like sitting right there at their throat. I had to make sure I got my money's worth. But that's the way we do God. I'm living in this world, God. I'm, I'm up to here. I'm about to throw up so I can't receive anything of you. I'll sit in your house, but I can't receive anything that you have for me because I'm so full of the world I'm about to throw up. You make Jesus want to throw up with that kind of attitude. As Peter said, where else will we go? That's what we got to have. We got to have that kind of attitude too. Say, all right, God, Jesus, you're the son of God. God's the only true and living God. Where else are we going to go? You're the only one that can help make me better. I'm not going anywhere. I'm sticking with you. Amen. Amen. You alone have the words of eternal life. So Peter didn't understand everything, but he did understand that Jesus of Nazareth could help him. (laughs) You know, when I first, I I know I've got a lot of Pastor Chris stories and things of that nature, but that's my testimony. And if it's my testimony, that's the stories I have from personal experience to to relay to you. I know what this means. I know what this, this looks like and feels like. When I first submitted under my pastor, well, let me back up a little bit. When I first attended and grafted word for a little while before I joined the military. There was another gentleman that I used to go to church in Solana with. He visited a couple of times. And so we, we got to talking about, you know, going to and grafted word. And he said, uh, he said, you know what? I kind of like that church, but I don't know if I could go there all the time. And I said, yeah, me too. I don't, I don't, I like, you know, the way he preaches and stuff, but I don't know if I could go there, you know, all the time and be fully fledged. I had to eat those words. But guess what? My heart changed because I wanted what Pastor Chris had. Not as a man, but as a man of God. I wanted the walk of God. I wanted that boldness, that confidence to know I'm not perfect, but I serve God and he helps me. He matures me. He helps equip me. And so when I submitted to Pastor, I didn't fully understand everything. Didn't understand his, you know, his, his, the full, uh, Full, fullness or uh, the word I'm looking for, the, the entirety of their ministry, but in, entirety of everything that God had for me, submitting under him. But when I did, God began to reveal things and began to show me things I need to change, things I need to work on. And the more that I got in depth with my pastor submitting as a disciple, the more God revealed things to me and helped me. And so it helped me be a better minister, helped me and prepare me to be a pastor. Now, it wasn't all just for me to be a pastor. It was to help me as a man of God first, as a man, then to help disciple me and equip me to be a pastor. Because first, no matter what title, no matter what role you fulfill, first you've got to be a Christian. You've got to be a disciple of Jesus Christ first and foremost. Because if you don't do that, then anything else you do is going to be in vain. You'll be like some of those that say, well, didn't we do this in your name? Didn't we do that in your name? They say, I never knew you. Or be like Galatians, it says, you did run well, but who did hinder you from obeying the truth? So you had it at one point, but what happened? And notice, I have it underlined in my Bible. I'm not going to turn there, but it says, who, not what, who. Who did hinder you from obeying the truth? Not learning the truth, not knowing the truth, but obeying the truth. Amen. Amen. So Peter didn't understand everything, but he did understand that Jesus of Nazareth could help him. That's the way we need to be. We need, first of all, understand that Jesus Christ can help us. The Word of God can help us. But you also got to realize your disciple maker can help you. Amen. Number two, a hunger for change. If you're happy being the same, you will never seek out change. That's why fat people stay fat, broke people stay broke, and crazy people stay crazy. Oh, I'm I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> we've, we've been over to a family member's house helping with some different things at their house. And on one of the shows that's usually later, you know, on later at night while we're trying to help do things is 
you know, where they had the big people, and I'm not going to name any of the shows, but they had the big people who's trying to lose weight. Well, many people will give an excuse. But I sit here, and, I, and I'm watching and while I'm waiting to help, help out. I'm sitting here, and I'm watching these two people. It was one, one was a woman, one was a guy. They both were largely, largely obese. They both had had surgery to help with this thing in their life. All right, so both of them, you know, are kind of in the same boat, but they both have different attitudes and different hungers for change. One, the lady, hers is, oh, this is too hard. I'll never measure up. I'll never do this. I'll never do that. And so her dad passes away. She gains weight. The other one, the guy, his attitude is, I'm doing this. I'm doing this. I'm living longer. I'm helping my family. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I'm changing. His dad dies. He still loses weight. Now you can say, well, what's that got to do with it? Both of them had a major something happen in their life, but it was all about their attitude and their outcome. Well, this happened to me. Well, are you going to let it be an excuse or are you going to let it be motivation? Because it won't be both. It's got to be one or the other. And it shouldn't be an excuse. I love what my pastor says. Excuses must be repented of. Excuses must be repented of. So... You can, you know, even though it's dramatic, I mean, it's not a good thing. It wasn't a, an easy thing for both of them to go through that, but it was all about the attitude, all about the hunger for change. One said, you know what? This doesn't mean as much to me. I'm going to give in and find comfort in this. The other one said, you know what? I'm, going to, I'm not going to give in. I'm going to have a hunger to keep changing because that's what my father would have wanted me to do. Well, how about your heavenly father? He's wanting you to change to look more like his son. So what's your excuse of not looking like him? If you have a hunger, you'll submit to discipleship, you'll submit to the word of God, you'll submit to prayer, you'll submit to the things that God has for you, and you'll have that hunger for change, and you'll begin to change. If you look like the same as you did two years ago, you haven't changed and you don't have a hunger for God. We've been pastors here almost two years. How much have you changed in those two years? And if you've been here since day one, you can tell my preaching style has changed in two years. A lot of things that we've done as a ministry has changed in two years. So if you haven't, it's not this ministry, it's not this church, it's not me as your pastor, it's your heart. You don't have a hunger for change. Amen. Hunger will allow you to endure the harder aspects of discipleship like correction, rebuke, and inconvenience. Hunger will allow you to endure the harder aspects of discipleship like correction, rebuke, and inconvenience. You know, when you're hungry for something, you're hungry for it. You don't allow things to distract you. You know, I can tell, I can look back, you know, even within the last, well, the last few years, and I can tell when I meant business about something. You know, we'll, we'll take me, I'll, take, I'll throw myself in there. Take about me losing weight. I can tell when I was, when I was determined to do it. Because there would be times where, you know, hunger pain would come up, and I'm like, well, Lord, you know, I've only got so many calories, so I need to make sure I monitor this. And so I would fight through that hunger. I would fight through something. I would fight, you know, maybe go get me some water, do something, and maybe get some coffee, something to help relieve that pain, but yet not give in. Then the other times that I was kind of, eh, you know, like some people walk with Jesus, eh, that as soon as that hunger pain come up, I'd go find me something. Well, I'll eat this, and I'd eat that little snack, and I'd still be hungry. Well, that was a small calorie. Maybe I'll get something else. But when you're hungry for it, you say, no, I'm determined. I'm determined. I'm determined to see this through. I'm determined to change. I'm not giving. I'm not going back to old lifestyle. I'm not going back to old habits. I'm pushing through, and I'm serving my God, and I'm not allowing this thing to come against me. I'm pushing through because I want change more than I want the old me, the old lifestyle, the old this, the old that. I want change more than I want anything else. And that change should be in our heart to look more like God and less like the world. Amen. But it will help you take... Correction, rebuke, and inconvenience. I've been rebuked by my pastor, didn't like it. But I also thought, you know what, Lord? This is my gift from Jesus Christ. So help me to receive that. Help me 
to put away the enemy's voice of saying, well, he's just getting on to you. He's just this. He don't love you. He don't. Shut up, enemy. Shut up, enemy. This is a gift from Jesus Christ for me to mature me, to benefit me, to equip me. <laughs> and, and kind of while I'm thinking about it, where was that enemy at when the drill sergeant was yelling at me? Where was, that, where was that voice at when all of these people screaming, cussing me, talking about my mother, talking about all these things in the military? That voice wasn't there. Huh. So that means that the discipleship that my pastor has for me is actually doing something for my spiritual walk with God and my eternity because he doesn't want that to change. He didn't mind somebody yelling and cussing at me, wanting me to change for the military, but he does mind it when the army of God, my commander in the army of God, is trying to get me to change. Hmm. Something to think about. Number three, humility. It takes humility to let your life be realigned by someone else's, or to someone else's, excuse me. So it takes humility to let your life be realigned to someone, to someone else's. By submitting to a discipler, you allow them to become a template that your life gets cut out to fit. They become your pattern. Now, I, I love how my pastor has written this. Disciplers are not the standard. Jesus is the standard. But disciples are living reflections of the standard. Remember what Paul says. He says, you follow, be imitators of me as I imitate Christ, or be followers of me as I follow Christ. He's saying, you follow me, you can be imitators of me, but I'm looking to be like him, so that's your ultimate goal, but you can follow me while we're trying to both work to get to that. Because if you take the fivefold ministers, if they're a gift from Jesus Christ, then they are not perfect because they're still men, they're still humans. So what they're to do is to point you to Jesus Christ. They're to point you to God the Father. So men is not the standard, but they can be an example unto us. Amen. But it takes humility to submit to that and allow your life to be changed to maybe even favor them in some areas. Amen. Number four, trust. You must trust the person you're submitting to. Their knowledge, their ethics, their character, and their track record. You must trust the person you're submitting to. That means when they tell you something you disagree with, you've still got to trust them. There's been a few times that my pastor said something, and I was like, I don't agree with that. But guess what? I had to humble myself, and I had to trust my pastor. I said, all right, Lord, just even going back to what I said, Lord, I'm trusting, you know, I trust my pastor. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to submit to him. So whatever you tell him, I'm going to do it because I'm believing it's from you. So I trust that he's hearing from you for me because that's my pastor. That's my disciple maker. So I'm trusting in both of you. <laughs> but that's part of that. We trust who we're submitting to. We trust their knowledge. We trust their ethics. We trust their character and their track record. Number five is contempt for excuses. The word contempt means the act of despising, a lack of respect for, or open disrespect. So that means you despise excuses. You don't have respect for excuses, and you openly disrespect excuses. Because excuses will be your number one friend if you don't want discipleship. They'll be your number one friend if you're a lukewarm Christian. <laughs> Excuses shortcut, short circuit discipleship. Excuses short circuit discipleship. We must be willing to kill our excuses and our excuse maker. Amen. The Bible reminds us that the blessing is in doing the word, not excusing ourselves from it. The blessing comes from obeying, doing the word, and not excusing ourselves from it. So discipleship, stage, multi-mentored, and seasonal. Discipleship is not meant to be every day for the rest of your life. Well, if you're, if you're seeing discipleship as a bondage, you're going, praise God. If you're seeing it as, I get to submit to somebody and learn, you're like, oh man, you mean there's a time I'm actually going to have to not do this? There's going to be a time where it starts to fan out, where it's not so you know, personal all the time? You know, that's like, you know, for me, you know, being a pastor now, 
I, I was actually feeling maybe a little guilty, maybe a little, a little backslidden because I wasn't getting to be around my pastors much, you know, having, you know, responsibilities here and doing things that was kind of interfering with me being around my pastor as much as I used to be before I was a pastor. And so I was like, Lord, I feel backslidden. I'm not getting to be around my pastor as much. But then even through my pastor helping me and speaking to me, he actually was describing this in a way to me. He says there, reach a, there comes a point to where you don't need it every day. You just do check-ins. You do check-ins or check-ups. And he says, because once you, once you mature, not fully mature and you know everything, but once you're mature enough, you can stand on your own two feet. You can do things, but you come in and get routine checkups just to make sure that everything's still flowing well and you've still you know, got you know, a correct heart towards discipleship, things of that nature. You're still trusting and, and you know, being humble. And you can still have that, that, that person in your life speaking into you and helping you and blessing you, leading you. Amen. But if that were the case, how could the Lord expect Christians to make disciples? Amen. So if, if the case was discipleship was meant for every day the rest of our life, how could we make disciples? Because we'd be too busy being discipled ourselves. So it comes a point to where we, ha- we, we don't mature and know all things, and then we just go out on our own completely, and we're just all done with discipleship. But we do those check-ins to make sure we're still right. This is what gets a lot of preachers and pastors in trouble is because they don't have a pastor themselves, so they get the big head and they begin to run things on their own. And they don't submit to somebody to keep them humble and to keep them in check with God. Amen. It is evident from the Great Commission that at some point, Christians are expected to graduate beyond needing regular hands-on training and move on to helping others in the same process. So that means that we've got to mature in the things of God. We can't stay a baby Christian all of our life. It means we've got to do what we're taught. We've got to do what we're trained to do. Consider these biblical facts. Staged. Jesus only discipled the 12 disciples for three and a half years. The 70 and the 120 were discipled for less time than that. The 12 disciples became the 12 apostles And were promoted to leading the early church in Acts 1. Once promoted to apostleship, they began making their own disciples and administering the early church. So we can see the growth. Why? Because they submitted to Jesus Christ as as disciples and they began to mature and be equipped by Him that they could one day impart into others. Multi-mentored. Paul was mentored by Ananias and, and uh, in Syria, Peter, James, the Lord's brother, and Barnabas. He was further trained by the elders at the Antioch church. He was promoted to early ministry with Barnabas approximately 15 years after his conversion. So it wasn't just an overnight process where all of a sudden he's like, oh yeah, let's go send you out now, Paul, now that you just got born again. That wasn't, we read it that way in Acts, but that's not the way that it was actually done. If you Do the timeline. There is some traveling. There's 15 years. That's a long time. 15 years of him just working, putting his hand to the ministry, doing other things, not being, we would say, a leader or a known leader in that regard. But he and Barnabas are finally sent out after 15 years of working in discipleship. He did not lead his own ministry for another two or three years. Because notice they sent them out together to work and to go do the ministry And then two or three years later, he's finally sent out to lead his own. At which time he took Silas to lead his own missionary work. We see the scripture there for that. Multi-mentor, we would say, slash staged. Timothy was probably converted to Christianity under Paul's ministry during his extensive work in Lystra, or Lystra, and Derby. But the time Paul returned to Lystra, or by the time that Paul returned to Lystra and Derby, Timothy was being promoted and commended by the brethren, having evidently been discipled by someone at the church. Paul took young Timothy under his wing and continued training him for ministry. So we also have seasonal. After a certain season of ministry discipleship, Timothy was ready to be set in as pastor. Paul ordained Timothy as the pastor of Ephesus and left him there to run things. After an unknown time... Timothy hit a rough spot and needed more help. 
This new season of discipleship came in the form of the, of the epistle of 1 Timothy. Titus experienced the same pattern, discipled by Paul, installed as pastor, then sent in an epistle. So we can see even with this, even with this, these biblical facts here, we can see that Timothy and Titus had their check-in. It may not have been, you know, Paul coming to see them every single time. Now, we know that he, had, he did go and see the churches. He did go and visit these ministries, these pastors, but he also sent them an epistle right, as a kind of a check-up or check-in. But that was to help further them to help and help disciple them even further in what they had need of. So modern applications. Discipleship is designed to take you from a convert to stable Christian in a short time. But that, remember, that's all dependent on your humility, your heart, your attitude, and being you know, trusting and not having excuses. It's an aim to instill basic doctrine, kingdom culture, work ethic, biblical morality, and a servant's heart. Its aim, talking about discipleship, is to instill, means it's in you. It's in you, to put inside of you. And if it's put inside of you, it should come out of you. Amen. Not like losing it, like it's coming out of you because it's in you. Basic doctrine, kingdom culture, a work ethic, biblical morality. Now, if we look at this list, there, this should be condemning to, to some Christians. Because although they go and sit and listen to a, a preacher because they don't allow discipleship in their life, because whether their pastor doesn't offer it, whether they don't submit to it, however, the kingdom of God has, has only has a remnant because of this right here. Because people don't allow doctrine to be instilled in them. They don't take on the kingdom culture. They take on the worldly culture. They don't take on a work ethic. They get lazy and make excuses. They don't have biblical morality because they want their, what they want. They have been told and they believe that they can be their own God and serve God at the same time. And you can't do that. And a servant's heart. Well, too many people don't want to have a servant's heart. They want to be served and not be a servant. The biblical president in precedent indicates that it is possible to go from pagan to fledgling minister in three to three and a half years. The first stage of discipleship will require, and we'll look at that in just a moment, but I want to back up for a, for a second. Uh, you can go from a pagan to a fledgling minister in three to three and a half years. As we've said, you know, Miss Tiffany and I have been pastors here almost two years. So that means, just to put this in perspective, Day one that we took over the pastorship here, the pastorate, if somebody was born again on that day, in about one to one and a half more years, we could send somebody out to do ministry work. That's the kind of perspective to bring that home. That's exactly what's being said here. But that's the Bible. But you got you to remember, it all goes back to those elements the heart, the excuses, the trusting, the humility, all of those things. But in roughly a year to year and a half, we should, if somebody was even born again, not, not already born again, born again on the first day that we, I ever preached here as the pastor, and we could, in a year, year and a half, we could be sending them out to do ministry work. That is something to think about. The first stage of discipleship will require a heart that looks up to someone God has placed in your life. For example, a spiritual mother, a mentor, etc. The next one is a regular Bible study in addition to faithful church attendance because what we put out here is good. It's good word. It'll be the word. We could put that into your life, but that's not going to help you in every area of life because I can only cover so much in an amount of time. So we've got to have our own Bible study, walk with God for ourselves, and that requires us to be in the word and to be in prayer. So I want us to, to note, these first two that we just mentioned, you must do on your own. You must do these first two. You've got to have a heart that looks up to someone God has placed into your life and have your own regular, regular Bible study. Number three, service in the ministry of helps. We, have, we offer this opportunity here to serve in the ministry of helps. But all three of these are part of discipleship, service in the ministry of helps. Some things can only be learned by doing. Not all discipleship is classroom learning. Amen. 
After you've matured and are a stable, dependable, knowledgeable Christian, you may only require a seasonal discipleship as new situations, battles, or callings arise. Now, I do want to note this first part of this sentence. After you've matured and are a stable, dependable, knowledgeable Christian. Once you've matured and you're stable and you're dependable and knowledgeable, then you qualify for church leadership. Well, give me a verse for that, Pastor. All right, I'm glad you asked. 1 Timothy 3.6. 1 Timothy 3.6. I'd encourage you to write that down. You can go back and look at 1 Timothy 3. You'll get a lot more than just what I'm about to quote you because it's the qualifications for church leadership. But verse 6 specifically says, not a novice, not newly planted. Somebody that's just, that hasn't just been born again, then all of a sudden you throw them into church leadership. You got to be somebody that's matured, that's been proven, that's been, you know, that is a stable, dependable, knowledgeable Christian. Then you can be put into church leadership. Well, what, how, what does that coincide with? That shows that you only need seasonal discipleship now. Somebody's not having to watch you and having to help you through all these small things because you've been proven to be stable, knowledgeable, and you know, dependable. Now we can say, all right, now you can help us lead others. You can be a leader in the house of God because you've, been, you've proven yourself to know things of God, to walk with God, and now you can help lead others. So this, this is seasonal discipleship. So some examples of different things as new situations arise, things of that nature. Courtship, engagement, and marriage require a new season of discipleship, frequently called premarital counseling. Starting a business, starting a church, or moving to become a missionary would also require another season of intense discipleship. Terminal diseases, death of a loved one, or divorce would require discipleship. Many major life transitions, for example, retirement, having a first child, buying a first home, becoming an empty nester, would all benefit from some form of discipleship. So there may arise a time when you need training in a precise area for which your current discipler is ill-equipped, at which time it might be necessary to get wisdom and training from someone else. Multiple mentors would totally be appropriate in scenarios such as Praise and worship training. Now, there was a time, you know, when uh, I know Reverend Mark Martin came into Engrafted Word, and he hosted kind of like a worship, praise and worship classroom sitting. And at that time, we had another praise and worship leader, but um, that person, along with myself and Elijah, we, we all went, um, well, that person's spouse too, we all went to set in on that because I had kind of given a heart and a vision, not, you know, in great detail because they were already you know, establishing things, but we went there for all of us to receive that training. And of course, I've learned things from Dr. Barclay about that, that I would try to pass on, learn things from Pastor Chris, learn things from SMTI, things of that nature that we try to pass on. So even having, you know, someone else like Reverend Mark Martin, which is a wonderful man of God, and that man's anointed to lead praise and worship, to go sit under him and to hear the things that he's learned over his decades of, of ministering in that regard. To receive from that, that was, that was wonderful training. And I've still got the notes on a lot of that. And I, and I still look back at those. But also financial training. Children's ministry training. Evangelistic, evangelic, evangelistic training. Evangelistic, excuse me. Brain's trying to get too fast for my tongue. Evangelistic training. Missions training, etc. But I will say, you've got to be careful who you allow to mentor you, uh, although in addition to that, I would say. Because not everybody, just because they're, they have a voice or have a ministry does not mean that they're qualified. I can think of different pastors in different ministries right now that they, they do not qualify because of sin, because of them rising up on their own and going out, not being raised up and sent out. Right? To be raised up and sent out is book of Acts, as Dr. Barclay says, but to rise up and go out is the flesh. So there's, there's the qualifiers, to be raised up and sent out. So not everybody, just because they say they have a ministry, doesn't mean they're qualified to do so. So that's when you've got to trust other leaders. You know, there's times I'll ask, I'll ask my pastor, i say, Pastor, what are your thoughts about this conference? What are your, what are your thoughts about this? What are your thoughts about this teacher? And he'll give, he'll give me a straight answer. Why? 
Not because he's a dictator. No, no, no. Because he says, well, I've heard this and I've heard this and I've heard this about this ministry. So I probably wouldn't partake in that. Yes, sir. Or, yeah, that ministry is good. I believe that'd be good for you. You probably, you know, it would help you in this area of ministry. Well, praise God. Thank you, sir. Because he's, he may have his hand or thumb on a pulse of somewhere else that I may not see. And here I am wanting to learn just out of a, out of a, a pure heart, we could say, wanting to learn and to grow in this area of ministry. But if I'm not knowledgeable of what's going on behind the scenes, I may be submitting myself to something that's inappropriate, something that would bleed in and cause, uh, you know, begin to cause a division between me and the right path that God has. Just something to think about. The two most critical keys to being discipled are observing and asking lots of questions. So the two most critical keys in being discipled are observing and asking lots of questions. May God help us to both be a disciple and to make disciples. Amen.